Welcome to the Creative Pen Podcast. I'm Joanna Penn, thriller author and creative entrepreneur, bringing you interviews, inspiration and information on writing, publishing options and marketing ideas for your book. You can find the episode show notes, your free author blueprint and lots more information at thecreativepen.com and that's pen with a double N. And here's the show. Hello creatives, I'm Joanna Penn and this is episode number 545 of the podcast and it is Friday the 9th of April 2021 as I record this. In today's show, I'm talking about writing, publishing and marketing books for children with Crystal Swain Bates. Now, so many of you ask me about this topic and it's not something I do myself. And uh, to be honest, many of Crystal's tips are relevant to all authors. We talk about writing a positioning statement for your book, how to write a story, not a lecture, finding an illustrator and dealing with contracts, the best print on demand services, book marketing in schools and encouraging diversity in our characters and in the author community. So that's coming up in the interview section. In publishing news and just general things, the Alliance of Independent Authors has a great post on library distribution, something you can do with your ebooks and audiobooks if you publish wide and, of course, with your print books through Ingram Spark. And it's such a great way to market your books, which is tell your readers they can get your books for free at the library if they order through their library portal for ebooks or audiobooks or ask their librarian to order. And of course, yes, you can get all my books. Uh, well, not all of them, almost all of them are everywhere uh, from your library. And uh, yeah, ebooks, audiobooks, print books can be ordered in. And of course, remember, you'll be in those catalogues if you do the various wide publishing. So again, links in the show notes, but that is on selfpublishingadvice.org. And talking of publishing wide, I hope you found the interview useful with Ryan from Google Play Books last week. And uh, we don't talk enough about Google Play, I think, mainly because the discussion is always focused on the big markets of US, UK, Canada, Australia. But for the rest of the world, remember, Android is the major ecosystem. And you guys know how bullish I am on international sales and growth. And also, again, talking of publishing wide, if you are struggling to report on your books in one place, I wanted to recommend Scribe Count, which is a relatively new platform. I've been using it for a few months now. Quite a few of us have been helping them with testing and everything. And uh, you can see everything in one place. In term, right now, it's for ebooks, but they have other platforms in uh, development for interfacing like Ingram Spark, ACX, Findaway, and more to come. Now, wide reporting has been an issue issue for years <laughs> for those of us who report wide. So it's exciting to finally have a tool. And yes, I am now an affiliate because I'm very happy to recommend it. And as I said, I use it myself. You can go to thecreativepen.com forward slash scribe count. And uh, there will be links in the show notes or on my tools page, thecreativepen.com forward slash tools. So I also wanted to talk uh, about Again, a podcast I've been listening to, I've mentioned it before, which is Spotify, a product story. And it's a really interesting podcast series. It's a limited series and it's about the development of the company. And this week's was on when your winning bet becomes your losing bet, which is essentially you build your company one way and then technology changes, the world moves on and you realise you have to switch direction because you no longer have a competitive advantage. And again, I mean, I talk about things changing and the, do not assume that everything is going to stay as it is because it is not. This podcast is is a good example. So some of you come for the interviews. So if you write children's books, you'll definitely be listening uh, to today's interview. And some of you are here for the news segment, this more personal segment when I talk about all the things I'm thinking about. And it's interesting because, of course, at the beginning, I only did interviews. And that was when I was in a very much learning phase of being an author. And uh, if I had only done interviews, I may well have stopped by now because I would have been bored and you would have been bored. And let's face it, there are tons of interview shows. Now, but we need the interview shows because it's interesting information, it's useful information and new listeners often come for the interviews. But if I had not added in the more personal reflection, if I hadn't have added in the AI and the futurist stuff, which is aim and the more advanced things and the more businessy stuff, then I would have fallen by the wayside and you guys probably would have as well. 
And it's so interesting because I feel like the reason I'm doing so many in between episodes is because lots of you are not at the point where you want to think about that. And and I can tell that by the download stats as to what topics people are interested in. But if I don't keep pushing the edges of what I think we need to be looking at, then I feel like I will lose my position in you guys listening, you know, you are my audience. And I want to keep pushing my own envelope of learning, but I also want to keep pushing yours. And in listening to Spotify, I was like, oh, it's so fascinating, the big pivots they have had to do to move uh, into new things, including huge technological rewrites around the way their database worked. And to me, that is akin to what we're looking at in the next decade. Um, and what we've had in the last decade, you know, it, and really what the pandemic has cemented is a shift to digital. Many of us indies, you know, we've built our business on digital, so it doesn't seem like a surprise. But for the rest of the world, the last year has been a huge shift. And so what I feel now in this next decade is this shift to an underpinning of architecture around blockchain, around selling direct, around quantum, around AI, around a lot of these technological shifts that are going to push us forward to that next thing. And on that, I'm also reading a book uh, called Tarzan Economics, Eight Principles for Pivoting Through Disruption. And the Tarzan principle is that you have to swing. So imagine swinging through. In fact, I think of George of the Jungle because I really like Brendan Fraser. (laughs) Uh, Anyway, think of George or uh, Tarzan swinging through the jungle. And of course, you swing on one liana and you have to reach out for the next one. And there's this moment where you're holding on to two of them, but you have to let go of the old one in order to swing forward into this new phase. And I feel like we all come into this many, many times on our author journey. You know, that uh, at the beginning, you're sort of clutching on, maybe you haven't even taken the leap yet. And then you, you start to swing and you get the hang of it. And then things change and you have to swing for the next thing. And um, yeah, I love this metaphor. I think it's brilliant. And at one point, you're reaching for this next one, but you have to let go of the old one. And uh, he says in the book, reaching out to the new vine will involve staring into darkness and facing your fear of the unknown. And the pandemic has accelerated the disruptive change that was already underway. And he talked about the music industry a bit like I talked uh, with Tristra a few weeks ago. It took 10 years of staring into a financial abyss for the industry to stop hesitating and start pivoting, to let go of ownership of CDs and and downloads and embrace the access model of subscription and streaming. And uh, this is also very timely because on the Ask Ally podcast this week, Orna Ross and I talk about subscription models and streaming, some of the challenges and why we need to embrace them as authors. So uh, you can just search for Ask Ally, A-L-L-I, or again, links in the show notes. And I, I essentially say, you know, I want to be in KU. It is the biggest subscription model for ebooks, but Uh, hopefully it will be non-exclusive. What's interesting is, let's say two years ago, you didn't find, or two, a couple of years ago, you did not find any traditionally published books in KU. It was uh, not considered an acceptable thing to do by the traditional publishing industry. And now you can see that expanding a lot. And those books are obviously wide. So what we've got at the moment is this Uh, one rule for them, one rule for us. And this is what we like to break down over the years. So I think that we should all be allowed to put our books in KU and also be wide. Uh, Obviously, we would probably get a lot less, a bit like ACX right now. If you're exclusive, you get a higher royalty rate. And if you're non-exclusive, you're still there, but you get a lower royalty rate. So maybe that's something they might consider. Uh, But there are obviously tons of other subscription models for ebooks and lots for audiobooks. So yeah, check that out. And then I also wanted to recommend a novel I just read uh, called The Once and Future Witches by Alex E. Harrow, which is my book of the year so far. Just wonderful. If you enjoy Lee Bardugo, Lainey Taylor, or if you enjoyed The Power by Naomi Alderman, I think you will love that book. So that's The Once and Future Witches by Alex E. Harrow. And uh, I'm reading a lot of books again at the moment. I've, I've kind of come out my finishing energy phase and I'm in start energy and I'm doing a lot of reading and writing on the shadow book. I've actually been collecting books for the shadow book for 
a long, long time. You could say for decades. So I've got a lot to work through. I also started digging out my journals again, which is always quite scary because mining my old brain is like going back several trees in the forest. (laughs) And most of the time, I don't even recognise the Joe of those days. Sometimes even a year ago, to be honest, I don't recognise some of the things that I thought a year ago. And that's why this podcast is also important. Uh, I mean, you can go back and listen to previous shows and there will be some nuggets there that you're going to find. But obviously, every week things change. So I'm always updating. And uh, yeah, I'm, I feel like we, our lives swing from one tree to the next or one liana to the next, from job to job or place to place and onto a new relationship or a new mindset. And, and that is the way it should be. That is, and if you're not moving, you know, you're dying. <laughs> And I'm so looking forward to getting out of my comfort zone very soon. Uh, hopefully we will be back out and our worlds have shrunk so much in this pandemic and I, I'm looking forward to our worlds expanding again. I've also been working on some technical things. Uh, I wanted to mention this and I'll now caveat, this is only relevant to those people who have search engine traffic who care about SEO, search engine optimization. If you have a website that is an important part of your business, like I do with the creativepen.com, a lot of my, a lot of you might have discovered this through a search on Google and then ended up on my website. And I have essentially spent 13 years now sort of building up SEO and traffic to my site. Now, what is coming in May 2021 is a massive Google update uh, for page experience and a new report on core web vitals. So this is a uh, something you do need to pay attention to. This is, and they announced this like a year ago that this was happening. So it's pretty technical. So I have found an expert on Upwork and I'm working through Let's say I'm working through fun things. (laughs) Fun in inverted commas. (laughs) If you are not concerned about traffic, do not even worry about this. Um, But for me, it has to be done. Perhaps if you are someone like me, then definitely look at this. I'll link to an article about it. But if you essentially... Google Google page experience or Google update May 2021, you're going to find lots of stuff about it. And then in useful stuff, if you write mystery, crime or thriller, check out Crime Week, which is a free online summit featuring some very big names. uh, And it's April 19th to 23rd, 2021. Uh, Big names including Karen Slaughter, Lisa Gardner, Ian Rankin, Peter James, Steve Berry and more. It includes training sessions, workshops, Q&As and a community network. And all the sessions are free. And yes, you can get the replay. So this is sponsored by Pro Writing Aid and I have an affiliate. You don't actually have to pay for the event. It is a free Crime Week online summit. Uh, check it out at thecreativepen.com forward slash crime week. That's thecreativepen.com forward slash crime week. So thanks for your emails and tweets and comments this week. Lots of them. Uh, So many of you enjoyed Jeff's episode on dialogue. Uh, Selena Jane said, I have always worried that my books are too dialogue heavy until listening to this episode. I really enjoyed it. And Anne Morrow said, listen to this podcast. Very helpful. I have Jeff's website bookmarked and just subscribed to his podcast. Kevin Dangor says, uh, the interview with Jeff was great. Dialogue is so important and the focus on character voice is a perspective I need to use more in my writing. I also wanted to say thank you to Emma who sent pictures from saint jean pied de port which is in France and it's the start um, it's the start of the Camino de Santiago and the end uh, Emma walked the Via Tosolana which is one of the paths in France and uh, she mentioned me- Memento Mori the most important thing I learned in 2020 and of course that is remember we will die and uh, very important to remember. And uh, Emma, you know, had that tattooed on her wrist, which I, I love. And uh, I, I've i booked my pilgrimage for next year. And as I keep kind of challenging us, it's sort of life really is short. So how are you going to spend this time? And 
And then finally, shout out to Connor Whiteley, who tweeted me, wow, I just sold a $5.99 ebook direct and the money's in my account. I think the penny has dropped around direct sales, uh, which is awesome. And of course, I talk about this and there is a tutorial, the creativepen.com forward slash sell direct tutorial. And uh, that is essentially what I am very excited about in terms of our next year. And in fact, funny going back to that book, the Tarzan book, um, they talked about Radiohead in there. And if you, if you remember, it was 2007 when Radiohead did their first um, album, selling it direct to their fans. And uh, I mean, the music industry is always ahead. I mean, and I've been selling ebooks direct since about 2009. But it's been a trickle, trickle, trickle until the last year when it's really taken off. So, and I know many of you have bought direct from my store, payhip.com forward slash the creative pen. And uh, yeah, so very exciting times. Glad that some of you are trying it. So today's show is sponsored by Draft2 Digital and I will play a word from Kevin Tumlinson in a minute. Also to add that I personally use Draft2 Digital to publish my ebooks to Nook and to library services. And I use Books to Read, number two, books to read.com, links on my site to point to wide retailers. Super useful service and you don't even need to use Draft2 Digital to use books to read.com. So this type of corporate sponsorship pays for the hosting, transcription and editing. But my time in creating the show is sponsored by my lovely patrons who also support the in between episodes, which don't have corporate sponsorship on. So thanks to all the new patrons in the last uh, week. Shannon Morgan, James Loscombe, I think it's Nicholas Leck or Leck Nicholas and uh, German Otter Werden, Otter Sein. So thank you so much. I did have another book out in German this week. And apologies if I just murdered that. <laughs> so thanks to everyone supporting the show on Patreon. The uh, Q&A will be coming in the next week. So get your questions in. You can support the show for just a couple of dollars or euros or pounds or Canadian dollars a month. And you'll get that extra monthly Q&A audio. And yeah, you do get to ask your questions and I answer things honestly and that you get the entire backlist as well. So come and join us and support the show at patreon.com forward slash the creative pen. Right, here's a word from Kevin at draft to digital and then we'll get into the interview. Hey, this is Kevin Tomlinson with draft to digital So if you've ever co-authored a book or tried to build a box set, you know the biggest pain is how to split up the royalties. That's why we at draft to digital have built D2D payment splitting. We've made it easy for you to share payments with other collaborators on your projects in whatever percentages you prefer. Right from the setup of your book, you can invite participants, agree on who gets paid what, and go. D2D takes care of all those pesky details like tax interviews and making sure everyone gets paid on time. And of course, you continue to own the rights to your work. So... Get started on your collaborative project now at drafttodigital.com. We've made it easy for you. See you there. Crystal Swain Bates is the best-selling author of children's books and the founder of Goldest Carrot Publishing, which seeks to fill the racial diversity gap in publishing. Welcome, Crystal. Thank you. Thanks for having me here. Oh, I'm excited to talk to you today because I get so many questions about writing books for children and I do not write books for children. I'm I'm happily child free and I'm like, well, I just have to get some best selling children's authors on the show. So I'm excited to talk to you today and get your tips. But let's start. Tell us a bit more about you, how you started writing, because you had a real interesting previous career and why you started your own publishing company. Absolutely. So yes, I've actually been writing since I was in elementary school. And it's so funny for me to look back and and know that as a kid, I just knew that I wanted to become an author when I grew up. But the thing is, as I got a little bit older, I started hearing that writing was not a viable source of income. And I believed it. (laughs) So instead of going to school for English or creative writing, I actually turned to one of my other passions, which was all things related to foreign affairs. So I went to school for international affairs. I got my master's degree in that. I ended up working as an analyst for the federal government. And I spent a few years living overseas. 
I loved it. I really did. But I still felt like something was missing. You know how you have your little, your list, your to-do list of all the little things, you know, so I wanted to travel the world. I did that. I wanted to live overseas. I did that. I learned French and I worked a fabulous job, but I still wanted (laughs) to, to pursue that childhood dream of publishing a book. And that literally is the reason I even thought about, you know, creating a publishing company, becoming an author. And, and that's what I did. But I mean, a lot of people are like, oh, yeah, writing a book is on my list. But you started a publishing company. And I mean, clearly, you're a businesswoman, and you're, you're savvy in that way. But how did you take that further from one book to lots of how many books have you got now? <laughs> oh, no, that's a good question. I think 15. Yeah, yeah I think exactly. 15. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, it's funny you ask that because when I started my publishing company, I had no idea what I was doing. But something about me is I like to set really, really big goals. You know, and I actually do resolutions. I know some people don't do resolutions anymore, but I still do them. And and so instead of me saying, oh, I want to try to write an ebook or try to start a blog, I said, I'm going to publish not even just one book, but six books. So that was my resolution was to start a publishing company, write and publish six children's books. And this was for 2013. And I actually did it. One of the things looking back that I can say is uh, what I really learned is that you don't need all the pieces. You know, sometimes we feel like we have to know how it's going to work. We have to know every step of the process. And I didn't know what was... (laughs) I didn't know what was going on. I didn't know what I was doing, but I said, I'm just going to learn along the way. And, you know, I've made mistakes along the way, but the, the things, the benefits of me publishing my books have far outweighed the mistakes that I've made. So yeah, that's, that's how I started. And I'm really glad that I, that I did this simply because when I looked at the market, I didn't see a lot of traditional publishing companies that were publishing books featuring Black characters. And that's why I started looking into self-publishing. Like, I just love the thought of having creative control over my books and the ability to publish the types of books I would have loved to have read as a kid. And so starting that publishing company for me was my, my way to do that. Yeah. And I know so many listeners resonate with that. And I also set resolutions. I'm like you. (laughs) But So, you know, and a lot of people listening obviously are uh, self-publishing their books. But it's interesting because it is a challenge self-publishing children's books in particular. So we're going to come into some of those challenges. But let's start with the writing. Maybe you could talk about the age range that you write for and what are your tips for writing books for children that age? Yeah, definitely. So something that I get a lot is when people find out that I'm a children's author, they always say, oh, I should write a children's book. (laughs) And I always kind of chuckle because I'm like, it's not quite as easy as you may think. I think a lot of people, they think of writing a novel, you know, something that would take them years to do, um, or so they think, they feel like writing a children's book will be something that maybe they can do in a day or a weekend. And there actually is uh, quite a bit of nuance when it comes to writing for kids. So something that I see a lot of people do is, number one, they start writing the book without knowing who the book is for, like the age range, you know, and that very much impacts the vocabulary that you use, you know, the content that's in that book. So one of the things that I suggest is always starting by writing a positioning statement for your book. Before you ever write a word, write a positioning statement for your book. And I think of a positioning statement as like the elevator pitch for your book. Because it's just a concise way to identify who your book is for and what that transformation will be for the child after they read it. So as an example, for my book, Big Hair Don't Care, I wrote that book because so many little girls at school were getting teased for having their hair just grow out of their head the way it naturally does, (laughs) be it, you know, in an afro or however their hair grows out. Kids were getting teased in school um, and getting in trouble, and it was just crazy. So I wanted to write a book to help boost their self-esteem. And so my positioning statement would have been something like, I'm writing a 
children's book to help four to seven year old girls go from being self-conscious about their hair to feeling more confident in their appearance. So that's an example of what the positioning statement for that book would have been like. And I find that when you write that positioning statement and you have a clear benefit, those stories tend to sell extremely well because it helps people understand why they should buy the book in the first place. You know, everyone wants to know what's in it for them. And the positioning statement helps explain that. And so that's one of the tips that I I love to tell people when they're working on the book. And this actually works for any book. It doesn't even have to be. I was going to say, we could all do with that. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, but you say that is so funny because, of course, most of us do just write a book and then try and come up with positioning afterwards. But I think with children's books, as you say, it's so important because a four to seven year old is going to be very different to a sort of 12 to 13 year old. So how do you then turn that positioning statement or that um, sort of ideal transformation into a story? Well, I turned it into a story um, by figuring out the key elements that I want to, to cover. So again, when I wrote this particular book, I knew that, all right, kids are, you know, getting teased for this particular reason. And then I started thinking of how can I make it fun? You know, how can I share this and and help increase self-esteem, but in a way that's fun. So I said, man, you know, because I have big hair. (laughs) So I said, let me think of my own, you know, put myself in some situations. So I said, let me put the main character um, playing hide and go seek, hide and seek, right? But her hair is so big that she can easily be found from her hiding place. I thought that would be one fun way to kind of explain her hair being being different and being bigger. And I just chose different elements like that. Her being at the zoo and, and her hair is blocking the view. Just fun things that are actually real life, but told in a way that actually makes it a positive thing instead of a negative thing. And so that's how I kind of weave that positioning statement into my book. And then I always carry it over to my title because I think it's very important for your title to be clear. And from that title, big hair, don't care. You already know what it's about. It's a girl who has big hair and she doesn't care <laughs> <You know? laughs> with a catchy title that rhymes. Um, it's just it, it makes people more intrigued and, and they want to learn more. So that's how I do it. What I will say is that something I see is that a lot of adults, when we try to write for children, we tend to write in a way that sounds a bit preachy. Do you know what I (laughs) mean? (laughs) You must be proud of your hair, little girl. (laughs) Yes. Yes. Just like that. And (laughs) so anyone that's looking to write a children's book, I, I encourage you to be very careful to make sure that the way that you're sharing the story or the lesson, um, share it in a way that's in, in more of a lighthearted tone that kids will actually enjoy. The point is not to be preachy. Um, the point is to let the, the character uncover the solution, right? And so my ultimate tip is to let the kid solve the problem in the story. Don't have an adult swoop in with the solution. Don't have an adult come in and say, as you just said, you must love your hair. You know, the child has to be the one that comes up with the solution. And so if you can do those things, you'll have a a story that that kids will actually want to read over and over again. And and that's the point, isn't it? Because kids that age definitely want to read over and over again. And what about rhyme? You mentioned, obviously, the title, Big Hair Don't Care, that rhymes. But what are your thoughts on rhyming uh, within the book for different types of books? I love writing in rhyme. For me, it's really fun. But, you know, I grew up writing a lot of poetry. And so writing in rhyme, I mean, a, a children's book that rhymes I I think of it as just a long poem. It's just a poem, right? And so I personally prefer to write in rhyme. Now, I will say that it does make my writing process so much longer. I mean, (laughs) I've had books where every page was done except that very last page. And it's because I couldn't close it out with the perfect rhyme, with the perfect meter. Um, And it just took me a lot more time (laughs) than I expected, but, but I really love to write in rhyme. And what I've heard from parents 
is that they enjoy it because they can read it in an interesting way. Kids love to hear it. And it also helps kids learn how to read. You know, if they hear cat and then and then a rat and then like they can hear it and it, it actually helps them with their comprehension. So I love to write in rhyme, but I don't think that writing in rhyme is for everyone because if you're using false rhymes, those words that don't actually rhyme, they kind of sound similar, it throws things off. And if you're unable to write using a good meter, you know, if you're if you can't tell that that one line was way too short for the next one, then it's not going to be a good thing for you to write in rhyme. So I tell people some some people can write in rhyme and some can't. Don't force it. If you can't do it well, then just don't. But for me, I love it. I, I think it's really fun. I love that. And it's interesting because I, I, for a few years now, been really into audiobooks and writing my books for audio. I write for adults. But when I moved to writing more for audio, my writing improved because, as you say, there's a meter. Well, even when it doesn't rhyme, there's a meter with the way language is spoken. And with audiobooks, it's similar to having kids. You know, they're reading out loud at that age. They're not going to be necessarily reading in their heads. They're reading with their parent or whoever, friend, auntie. I'm an auntie. <laughs> so it's like, well, having that playing with language, I think, is what you're you're doing there, right? You're you're making it it's fun for you and for the kid. There's no point in not being fun. <laughs> exactly. Yep, exactly. Yeah. And then this is another big challenge is the illustrator, because of course, most people listening are authors and you're a writer first. So what are your tips on finding an appropriate illustrator and working with an illustrator? Because of course, that's so important, especially for that age group. It really is. And I mean, once you finish writing your story, finding an illustrator can be a difficult part of the process because we just don't know, like, where do you find an illustrator? How much should you pay them? How much creative control <laughs> should they have? So it is very hard, but the illustrations are just as important as the text. So it's really important to get this part of the process right. So what I suggest is that Number one, just take your time when looking for an illustrator. You don't want to try to rush this process because your final result, you want it to be something that you're proud of. You can join online communities of authors and you'll see a lot of people will say, oh my goodness, I just published my book and this is the illustrator I used. I love him. I love her. You know, and so you can get referrals that way. You can search online freelancer sites to find illustrators, places like Upwork. But whatever you do, always have them do a paid test before you hire them. So before you hire them for the full project, just say, hey, I'm looking for an illustrator to, to illustrate my children's book. And I'd love to hire you for a test illustration. And you tell them what you want them to draw. That is going to be very important because if they're unable to bring your vision to life, you want to know that sooner than later, right? You want to know that within that first couple of weeks before you've actually invested three months waiting for them to, to draw your illustrations only to discover that it's not what you expected. So that's my most important tip is to search online, have someone do a paid test, and you might have to find three people to do a paid test. You know, and I don't look at it as losing money. I look at it as taking the proper steps to make sure that I find the best person to work with me. And then finally, you want to provide as much detail as possible for the best results. Sometimes I think as authors, we will have a vision in our heads and we just expect everyone to understand <laughs> what that vision looks like. And that's not going to be the case. You have your illustrators that come from all over the world and what they think of, for example, I had someone that wanted a pitcher of iced tea. This is back when I used to help people actually publish their books. I went through the entire process for them. I don't do it anymore, <laughs> but when I used to, when I used yeah. to do that, um, she wanted a pitcher of iced tea to be on the table. And so the illustrator drew iced tea, but it wasn't for her, she wanted Southern iced tea, which was in a specific type of picture. You know, do you know what I mean? In a certain color. And so it's, it's just like these little tiny things that 
no one knows. I once had someone that wanted a robot in her illustration. The illustrator drew a robot, which was square, which is what I think of when I think of a robot. And she was very upset. And she said, the robot is square. He should be round. Uh-huh. <laughs> like should that, he? like that BB BB eight or whatever from Star Wars, who's round and he's made yeah. made it. People now think about robots as round, but right? I, I, and and well, that's really interesting because we have these challenges with the translation when you can't even know what the words are, and also with audio um, performance or narration of our fiction. Is that it, it is in a way it's a it is a collaboration, and is it a collaboration with an illustrator so sometimes you'll be like yeah your artistic vision is right or are you really like you're you're suggesting we tell people tell them this but having worked with a lot of professionals myself I find that there is a, a line between controlling everything which makes you a bad client (laughs) and also sort of (laughs) adhering to your creative vision and as you said the more you say up front the more likely it is to to match or to at least come close but to be honest it never matches is is that what happens with illustration too you know and, and you raise a good point you don't want to to share too much. You don't want to request too much. And it all depends on the actual content of your book and what's important. So for me, what's most important is that my characters look a specific way. I want them to be true and authentic to what I think of (laughs) when I think of uh, a Black child from the way that their hair is styled to, let's say, the, the actual skin color, the actual skin tone. And so those are the things that I focus on And I do that during the character design stage. After that, then I'll just say, okay, in this scene, the character's in her room reading a book. That's it. Or if I want, if I know I want that room to be girly, I'll say the room should be pink and girly. And then I let the illustrator do whatever they're going to do to make that room look like that. But I don't have, you know, uh, any more detail that I provide outside of that. So again, for me, it's getting that character right. And once the character is good to go, then I'm I'm fine. So I, I it's definitely a collaboration, and it's definitely a situation where if you have something very specific, you you should be providing some sort of a reference image to start, you know, to begin with, because sometimes people just don't know what things look like or what you want them to look like. So any references you can provide up front will will be very helpful. Yeah, exactly. I, I feel like in a way, it's a bit like working with a book cover designer, because if you specify too much, it's, it, it probably won't be what you wanted in the end. Yes. But another important point would be the contract, because of course, illustrations have a separate copyright to the the words and then the layout. Also, that can be related. So how do you deal with contracts? Well, I personally only use work for hire contracts. And so the work for hire contract means that I have, I own the copyrights to all of the illustrations. And I use work for hire contracts because when I do children's books, I don't just make my money from selling the book. I can then put that character on a t-shirt and now I can sell it. And you can't do things like that if you don't actually own those illustrations. So I try to encourage people to do work for higher contracts. Not all illustrators do them. So if that's something that you're looking for, then you want to mention that up front. Hey, I'm looking for an illustrator to do a work for hire job. And sometimes they'll charge more. You might find an illustrator that says, okay, well, if you want work for hire, it's going to be double the price, but it's worth it because now you get to own it. You know, so those are the types of contracts that I suggest, because Mm -hmm. again, I love to be able to have that freedom to do whatever I want with the illustrations and be able to, to really add an entire product line (laughs) later on, which is one of the things that I've done. Yeah, absolutely right. And again, as a business person, that is so important. And I I almost feel jealous in a way of children's authors, because there's, again, writing for adults, uh, unless fantasy authors often have designed maps and, you know, icons, but most of the rest of us don't. So you don't really have artwork that you can use to turn into merchandise or, but with kids books, you're exactly right. I mean, you can turn these characters into other things and kids love it and parents love it. And it gives you other 
other products and streams of income from the same thing. But I did, I wanted to move on onto the challenges with publishing the books, because again, one of the biggest challenges is the fact that these are full color. They often have a thicker paper because of course a four-year-old can <laughs> rip stuff. They might have hard covers, for example, or they might have, you know, different, it, basically what are the challenges and how do you do it? Do you do print runs? Do you do print on demand? How do you do that? Yeah, so children's books are definitely much more expensive because you're dealing with books where every single page is in color. Um, I mean, full saturation. And so one of the things that I do is I, I do print on demand and I like print on demand simply because I don't have to, it takes all the extra work out of it for me. I have explored looking into board books. And the thing is, there are no print on demand board book companies. And so, as you said, when you're writing for children and kids get these books, when kids get my books, they love them. And sometimes parents will send me a picture with the kid holding up the book. And I'm like, man, that book is beat down. <laughs> you know, <laughs> They really love this book. And, and so I see the benefit of, of printing, doing a, maybe a run of maybe two or 3,000 board books just to see how I like it. But that's definitely something that you have to consider. So one of the things that I like to suggest is when you are publishing a children's book, I suggest actually going with print on demand, at least initially. And I like that because that way it gives you a chance to just see how well your book does before you go printing off 5,000 copies and having to store them in your garage or your closet. Let's make sure that people actually like the book. Let's make sure kids actually like the book. Let's make sure there are no typos. Let's make sure there isn't some sort of hidden image or some sort of a racial bias that you never noticed that's hidden deep inside of your book in one of the illustrations. And that's what I like about print on demand is it gives you a way to test the market before you invest in spending the money to, to actually bulk print your own books. And so that's what I've done. My books are available in paperback. They're available as hardcover books. And some of them are available as ebooks. And right now I'm actually working on getting all of those as audiobooks as well. Mm, are you narrating them? I don't think I have the voice for that. <laughs> oh, really? Because because uh, I I watched you with the kids in the schools on your videos, and it just makes me feel like your voice would be great. <laughs> oh my goodness! It's funny because I've I've tried out different voices and tried to hire people, and I'm like, I don't know. That voice just isn't quite it. But I don't know. <laughs> I mean, I think it would be funny just to have an author narrated version of it, but I don't know. I don't know. Oh, and that I, would be something I to I think test. you're great. I think you're great. <laughs> and I think your voice fits your main characters. I mean, Aww. it really does. And you've got a young voice too. This is this is another thing. Like I've done quite a lot of voice training now and I've got a young voice too. Yes. There are those of, of us who can sound younger and enthusiastic and doing stuff for kids. But I, I think you should give it a go. But I did, okay. also, I, I did want to come back on the, the print on demand. So who are you using for print on demand? For print on demand, I use Amazon KDP for paperbacks. And I use Ingram Spark for hardcovers. Fantastic. That's what we all use it for, mm -hmm. for other books. I just, I, I didn't know. So KDP Print does full color, you know, decent quality stuff for the, for the kids books. Yes, they do. And the quality is actually very, very good for the children's books. When you're using Ingram Spark to get that same quality, you would need to get the premium color. So... I actually really like it. I, I love working with, with both of those companies. And I love knowing that I can use Ingram to get the distribution to bookstores and retailers and that I can use Amazon to get to all of the people, the millions of people who shop on Amazon um, looking for books. So for me, it's the best of both worlds. 
No, fantastic. Okay, so I wanted to talk about schools because, as I said, and I'm going to link to it in the show notes, there's videos of you teaching the, <laughs> the or not teaching the kids, you know, reading to the kids and, and asking questions. And it's it's really awesome. But obviously, we're still, we're recording this. It's still a pandemic and uh, schools have been closed and things have been difficult. So what is happening with your work with schools? I mean, ha- can yeah. are, are more authors doing stuff online now or it, are you just waiting to go back physically into schools because because of that age group really well I'm definitely doing things virtually which is very weird I must admit but you know when in business you have to know how to pivot and and that's exactly what I've had to do so I recently did a book reading for it was a university sponsored event And I think I ended up reading to three or four different classes, or when I say classes, I'm age groups. So like five or six classes at a time. And so what I do is number one, the university ordered a ton of books. So every student actually had the book with them. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah. (laughs) Nice, nice gig. (laughs) I said, I need to do this more often. Yeah, it was great. So every kid had the book. I read from the book and I held the book up. But then one of the things that I did after that is I still wanted to have the interaction. So I I opened up, um, I like to ask questions. And so I might say, did you notice the X, Y, Z in this page? What did you see here? Or what I'll ask questions and then kids can come up to the computer and they can share because a lot of my books are about self-esteem. You know, I'll say, what's something that you love about yourself? And the kids will come up. I love the color of my eyes. I love my big toe, like whatever they'll come up and they're super excited. So I really feel like I've found a way to make it work. It it's not the same as being in person, but it it's been working out so far. So I do miss the kids. I think it's important for them to actually see me in person. <laughs> mm. And I say that because growing up, I never saw a black author. Mm. And I've met adults in person. And it's crazy because they see me and they're like, wait, did you write this? You're the author? And they get, I mean, as grown adults, they get very emotional just to see me, to see me doing this. And so I think it's really, I love to meet a kid and see how they look at me. I have a really cool video and I'm autographing this girl's book and she's looking at me and she's like looking at what I'm writing and she's looking back at me just in awe. And I know that I would have been that little girl had I had the chance to meet an author who looked like me. Because as I mentioned, I wanted to, I've always wanted to write. And there's just something about seeing someone else that looks like you doing something that you're interested in that makes you feel like you can do it too. So I don't know if that comes across completely when I do the virtual readings, but I'm still happy to do them because I'm able to reach more people in a lot of different places without having to be there in person. Mm. And it broke my heart when I heard that as well, because I mentioned before, my niece is mixed race and I want her to see people like her everywhere. I want her to know that she can do whatever she wants. And people listening, we've got people all over the world listening, people of of all different races. And it's like, I think it's so encouraging to hear you say that, to, you know, to just, just go out there and be <laughs> and, <Yes. laughs> and, and, and write those characters into your books as, as you've done. And it's just so important, I think. Yeah, it, it really is. And, and it's, one of the most fulfilling things about what I do. I just, I, it's so crazy to me to think that, wow, I wanted to write books when I was a kid and here I am doing it. And now I feel like I'm actually encouraging other aspiring authors to write as well. So it's, it's just an amazing experience for me. Mm. So then just back on that that, uh, university event, these school events, how are you getting those? Like, are you pitching them? Do you send letters? Are you doing mass mail outs or are you connecting individually or how are you marketing yourself basically? Mm, Good question. So I, I don't do any of those things. Well, I've recently Um, gotten on with a PR company. And so that's been awesome for like getting booked for speaking events and things like that. But when it comes to schools, universities reaching out, the way that I market um, is mainly with social proof. And so 
what I mean by that is I have a lot of pictures that parents will send me or will tag me in online. And so it's something that I've added to the back of my books. I added my Facebook and my Instagram. And I did that because when people love your book, they're happy to share it. And I wanted to make it easy for them. You know, they didn't have to search for me. Literally, the information is right there on the book. And so that's worked out extremely well because what happens is when people start seeing other people with your book, it's like they develop like FOMO, you know, fear of missing out. They're like, wait a minute. She's saying that book was really good for her son. I have a son of that same age. I should get the book too. And what ends up happening is it's a trickle down effect because then other people see it, bookstores see it, they get interested. Oh, you know, universities see it, schools see it. And so that's kind of the been the, the main way that I've actually been able to market myself. And what I would do is I would just kind of repost these pictures on my Instagram page or repost them on my Facebook page. And it might not sound like a lot, <laughs> but it's it's just it's something that it's better to have someone else commenting on how great your book is than for you to always be the one talking about how good it is. And so that's the power of social proof. Mm. So, I mean, a lot of people struggle with just starting that because, but you you started in 2013, right? So is this just basically being slow and incremental growth? Yes, I would say that, but I've also been strategic. So i I started out all the way back in 2013, reaching out to to influencers. So if you look on YouTube, I have a ton of people that have read my books and they read them on YouTube or or share their, you know, their thoughts on my books. And, And so YouTube videos live pretty much forever, right? They live so much longer than a tweet or a Facebook post or even, you know, an Instagram post. And so because people use YouTube as a search engine, I've created a marketing strategy that makes me very visible on YouTube. And that's another way that people find the books. And and I mean, video is everything. Video is very important these days and people love to watch video. And so that creates something that now I can send to a university or that I can put on my website and have people see, oh, wow. Okay. She's got a lot of people who love the books. Let me figure out how I can bring her in. And so I get a lot of emails. I'm still getting emails from people who actually want me to fly in, which um, I'm not interested in doing at the <laughs> right moment. Now. Maybe next yeah. year. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> maybe next year. But, and, and then the final thing I'll say on that is I have just simply asked people. So whenever I meet someone that works at a school, I say, hey, I'm an author. I have these great books. Let me show them to you. And I would love to come into your school. I mean, that's actually one of the easiest things to do because a lot of people are, they're looking for people to come in for their programs. So if they know that you're, you're an author, and especially if you're a local author, and they don't have to pay for you to, to fly you in or anything like that, then it, it makes it very easy for them to, to recommend you to their principal. And one of the things that I used to do before the whole world uh, fell apart is I would do these free parties at schools. So I would say, hey, I'd love to come in to your after school program and I'll do a free coloring party. So I would literally bring in my coloring books because I also have coloring books as part of my roster. (laughs) And I would bring the crayons and I would do a little Q&A But in exchange for doing that, they had to let me set up a little table to sell my books. And I only did it on like PTA nights, like PTA nights where the parents come in or when they have school plays. And I know that most of the parents will be at the school. And that was how I made my money very easily, very quickly getting into schools and quickly selling, you know, I don't know, $500 worth of books in 20 minutes and then just going home and the school didn't have to pay anything so uh, yeah. I love that I think so often we get so obsessed well I do and I think a lot of authors for adults we get obsessed with online marketing but you've basically done a lot of in-person marketing so either physically mm-hmm. or with video and I do think that suits a certain type of personality though and like I said you're very good on video and you're clearly really good with the kids and, and the parents and everything and I'm I, I'm looking at you going oh I could just never do that <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, but you know, I, I, first of all, thank you. But I did not start being comfortable on video. I mean, there, <laughs> what's funny is that I just started going live. Maybe, um, I want to say late 2019 was like my first time going live. I was so scared. So, you know, I'm not naturally a video person and I tend to be very private as well, <laughs> but I said, I have to do this. And, and so the more I started doing it, the easier it felt for me. And now I feel very, very comfortable with it. And so now I said, all right, I need to literally take every one of my books and make a video on it and put that video on YouTube. Because especially for children's books, sometimes people just want to see what is, what's in your book. What do the pages look like? I encourage people... I have a Facebook group of uh, over 5,000 aspiring authors. Um, And one of the things I encourage them to do is to just do a video flip through. You don't even have to be in it, right? So it's perfect for shy people, but just take your camera, hold it up or have someone else hold it up and flip through the pages because sometimes people just want to see what does it look like on the inside? And that's enough for them to buy the book. Interesting. I'm. That's very encouraging that you weren't a natural video person because I mean I've tried and and obviously we're doing this audio only because <laughs> I'm just I'm just don't want to do video anymore. But yeah, I think you're right. Is that the Facebook group you mentioned? Is that can you mention that or is that a closed one? Oh no, it's open. Yeah, it's called Six Figure Self Publishing Secrets. Oh, sounds good. <laughs> yeah, you know, and and it's called that because. I feel like, you know, I mentioned that when I was growing up and I was interested in writing, I just never knew that you can actually, you know, make money from selling books. And so I want to change that narrative. And so, yeah, Six Figure Self-Publishing Secrets, and it's it's on Facebook and it's open to anyone. And p- every day people in the group post um, their wins. You know, I just published my book or I just finished writing my book. I'm looking for illustrators. You know, people give illustrator recommendations. It's just a really supportive online community. Oh, that's fantastic. So yeah, as you did mention like you, you didn't think you could make money. So how and that your family also thought the same thing. So have your family changed their tune now? Are they, are they happy with your because this is your full time career now, is it? This is my full time job. Um, well, I've always had support uh, from my family, like my, <laughs> my mom, um, she never, no matter what I told her, like, all right, I'm going to quit this great government job. <laughs> <laughs> to go and write some books and publish them. You know, always, always supportive. And actually, my mom is the reason I was in, able to get so many, you know, good reviews was because she she completely bought into it. She loved the books. She knew that we needed them. And she literally just reached out to everyone she knew and told everybody that she knew about the books. So I think that's been a big part of why I've been able to kind of start this out and grow, you know, slowly, but be comfortable is because I do have a lot of support. And my family, they're such big supporters of me, and they absolutely are my biggest fans. So like, literally, my husband will tell someone that I'm an author, but when I never plan to tell them, we'll go to dinner. (laughs) And he's like, you know, my wife is uh... (laughs) a... To, to like the server actually, or something. Yeah, waiter. to the server. <laughs> to, the, to the server. My wife is a best-selling children's book author. You should f- find her book. It's just hilarious. <laughs> oh, I think that's that's so sweet. And we all need those cheerleaders. So that's fantastic. Yes. Um, so just bef- we we're almost out of time, but obviously you've talked a lot about encouraging diversity in children's books and in characters and also with children's authors. But I feel like we also need to encourage more diversity in the indie author community as a whole. So what do you your thoughts on how do we help encourage new writers of color? Um, how do we how do we do better? <laughs> basically, oh, and that's that's a whole separate. <laughs> I know it's a whole separate podcast, episode, but, you know. <laughs> right? <laughs> but in brief, oh, and I have so many thoughts on this. But number one, I will say just by by actually doing a little bit of work to find to find your your writers who are uh, more diverse. You know, we might not be quite as visible. You do have to look for us, but by finding us and bringing us on, even with the schools, just kind of, I mentioned, I'd never even seen a Black author, but I'd seen white authors come in all the time. So it's just being more intentional about making sure that kids are able to see writers 
who look like them in some sort of way and know that it's a possibility for them as well. So, so it starts there. Um, But then I'll also say just as far as the bookstores are concerned, like I have issues even with the bookstores because I don't know how, if they do this in the, in the UK, but having the separate sections in the bookstore where at home, it's like, here's the African-American section. Yeah. And it's this <laughs> tiny little section where these are the few books written by Black authors, but everyone else's books get to go into a, a, a genre. You know, these are <laughs> historical fictions. These are these are comedies. These, these are thrillers. But we are, you know, limited to this tiny little section and no one goes in that section. I mean, no one goes in that section unless it's Black History Month and someone feels obligated to <laughs> share, <laughs> to go you know, find, find a Black book for the month of February. So <laughs> it, it's things like that that I think are, are just set up in ways that make it more difficult for us to be discovered. Yeah, and it's interesting because I think uh, you, you're absolutely right. And it's uh, we have actually now in the UK since since the Black Lives Matter you know marches last year, the Black Writers Guild in the UK, which mm-hmm. you can actually go and there are lists of authors who write in different genres, and that's I think really important too. As you say, it's being able to be intentional about that. And I guess again, I get questions quite regularly from people who say, can I use my real name on my cover or is it too racial? And this might not be black authors, this might be Indian authors or sure, yeah. you know, authors from all kinds of places. And can I put characters of color on the yes, front of my book on the cover yeah mm-hmm. and or will that put <laughs> put people off like and I'm like oh and I obviously I hope I always say you know you you must choose yourself but I really think you should do what makes you happy and please do put you know characters of color on your cover if that's what you want to do and I mean name is different though I think because sometimes like I use uh, different names we all can use different names as publishers but I still I still find it such a difficult question what are your thoughts yes oh my goodness well I understand it honestly I, I do understand and that's what some of the publishers do they do kind of whitewash the book covers. And so what I would tell someone is that if you do put a, um, like in my case, I mean, if you look at my book, I'm a pretty princess, there's a, you know, a beautiful black princess there. And so there's no denying, um, even though the book is not about her being black, (laughs) there's nothing, the book is for everyone. It's not even about her being black, but she's black and she's on the cover. But I know that for the most part, Black parents will buy that book or white parents that have um, biracial or multiracial children. And I already know that. So it is true that your your reader will be impacted by the color of the character on the cover. I mean, it's, it's just that way, unfortunately. But for me, I'm not concerned about that because I know that this is what people are looking for. It might not be everyone that's looking for it, but if you have a child that looks similar to that character, or if you want to expose your child to characters that don't look like them, then this is the book for you. So you just have to to make a decision and be comfortable in that. But I know that for me, I would never choose to whitewash my cover for fear that people won't buy any of my books because they do have Black characters. Yeah, absolutely. That's fantastic. And I've really enjoyed talking to you and so many great tips there for kids books. So where can people find you and your books and everything you do online? Oh my goodness. So uh, everyone can find me on social media. It's at C Swain Bates. So it's the same handle across all social media. And all of my books are on Amazon, um, crystalswainbates.com. And that's also my website is crystalswainbates.com. And again, if you're interested in joining my community on Facebook, it's called Six Figure Self-Publishing Secrets. And if you're interested in any of my courses about publishing books, then you can find those at publishwithcrystal.com. But this has been so much fun. I mean, this was such an honor to even be here with you talking books, chatting about children's books and diversity. And so I really thank you and appreciate you for having me on. Oh, thanks so much for your time, Crystal. That was great. Awesome. 
So I hope you enjoyed the interview with Crystal today and that it helped you with ideas for your books and marketing. I definitely recommend checking out her videos with kids as well if that's something you want to do. They are so full of energy and I found them quite inspirational. In next Monday's show, I'm talking to Mark Leslie Lefebvre about his new book, Wide for the Win. And we also talk about how you can be a relaxed author, which I know many of you will find (laughs) a little odd. Uh, Get off the hamster wheel of writing as fast as possible and constant promotion. And uh, Mark and I have a few ideas around that. And uh, we always have a bit of a banter. We've been friends for like a decade now. So I know you will enjoy that coming up next week. So happy writing and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. You might also like the backlist episodes and show notes available at thecreativepen.com forward slash podcast. You can also get your free author blueprint at thecreativepen.com forward slash blueprint. If you'd like to connect, you can tweet me at The Creative Pen or find me on Facebook at The Creative Pen. See you next time.